So today I'm going to be talking about Eigenlayer from the perspective of a developer and the idea of kind of really comparing what can be built by leveraging Eigenlayer to something like AWS or cloud compute and just a developer platform for building not only protocols, but for building applications. So my name is Nader. I'm a developer relations and developer experience engineer working with Eigenlayer. And I've been doing developer education for about 10 years. And I've been in the Web3 space for a little over three years. And before I joined the blockchain world, I was working at AWS for three and a half years, leading the developer relations team as a, uh, uh, the main tech that we worked on was like full stack cloud. So we did all of the mobile SDKs, all of the web SDKs, and we integrated with all of the cloud technologies. So most of my experience has actually been around application development and full stack development. But I've also been a developer for 12 years. So even while I've been doing the role of DevRel, I went on a streak of almost like 400 something days up until a few weeks ago after joining Eigenlayer where I was committing something to GitHub, pushing some code up every day. So I like to build stuff. Anyway, um, if you want to follow along with all of the resources that I'm uh, going to be sharing during this talk later, this is a really good page that has everything. So this is going to be a link to conference talks, YouTube videos, podcast interviews, documentation, reference architectures, all types of stuff to kind of get you started building with Eigenlayer. And if you do not have your phone around and you just want to find uh, th these resources later, we have a similar, maybe slightly smaller group of resources at docs.eigenlayer.org. At the bottom of the, uh, the links, there is a, a page called resources. All right, so I'm going to start with like a problem statement or a challenge that exists in the world today in this space. Developers want to build decentralized infrastructure, but it's not, e it's not an easy thing to do. Um, what we had with the evolution of blockchains, which I'm going to dive into in just a moment, was we had these application-specific blockchains like Bitcoin and Litecoin and et cetera. Uh, we then had the first smart contract blockchain, which was Ethereum. So developers no longer needed to kind of architect an entire network from scratch if they wanted to build an application. They could then instead just write a smart contract and in uh, return they are essentially deploying to this network and they are inheriting the security of that network. So the idea of just being able to like write a dApp was really revolutionary and kind of brought everyone into Web3 as it kind of exists today, or I would say existed up until maybe a couple of years ago before we started getting into the more like modular space with rollups and things like that. But the challenge that, or I wouldn't say it's a challenge, but the, um, the world as it exists today, it's that you can actually build a dApp on Ethereum, but you can't build anything else, right? You can't say, I want to build an Oracle leveraging economic security from Ethereum using Ethereum as it exists. And the general problem that Eigenlayer is hoping to solve is that it is hard to bootstrap a decentralized uh, infrastructure from scratch. And, and you might even go further than this to say it's actually hard to build any type of reliable infrastructure in software, period. If you have ever used AWS, you might have noticed that US East One, which powers a large majority of the internet, goes down every year. And when it goes down, everything goes down. And that's not because you wrote any code that was wrong. It's because the underlying infrastructure that you were using went down and your app goes down. So if the most talented cloud engineers in the world that have been doing this for dozens of years can't get it right, it's you know, hard for most people to get it right all the time. But what's really great about Ethereum is that it's actually the most robust infrastructure that has ever existed in the software world that I know of. It has been up and running for a long time, and there are maybe one or two incidents where people can point to and kind of say that it was technically unusable um, for the actual like, usage of what people expect it to be there for. So what if we could kind of take that stability and that security and use that to power other networks? So Eigenlayer is a protocol built on Ethereum that introduces, introduces this idea of restaking. 
Now, with, when I heard of restaking, it was not interesting at all to me. It sounded like DeFi. It sounded like, um, you know, people that are speculating and, and stuff like that because I just didn't understand it at all. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized this is actually really, really cool and really, really um, revolutionary almost and what it actually enables. To me, it was not interesting it's in and of itself, but the means to an end was really interesting. So using Eigenlayer, you can use the stake and you can use this economic security of Ethereum to power other networks and also to bootstrap networks that in the past you would not have really logically been able to build due to the fact of how specialized they may have been and how small the number of users may have been for these more specialized use cases. Um, because of the amount of security you would need to build something in that fashion would not have made sense for these more specialized use cases. So the TLDR is this. It's shared security for Ethereum, or it's increasing the programmatic or the programmability of Ethereum. That's kind of the TLDR of what Eigenlayer enables, and I want to actually talk about what that means. And I like TLDR, so I often will like, talk about something and then try to TLDR it afterwards. So before we dive into that, the actual protocol itself and how it works and what you can do with it, let's talk about shared security in practice and kind of the evolution of blockchains over the years. So like I mentioned before, early on, the first blockchain was Bitcoin, and you could do one thing. It's a ledger. It's keeping up with balances, and you're sending balances. You're sending, um, I guess, coins to each other, and the whole purpose of the network is just to keep up with this. But you couldn't actually deploy an app to Bitcoin, right? It's just not, that's just not what it was there for. Ethereum enabled the first time that anyone could just write a, a small amount of code, literally like 10 lines of code, hello world. You're now building your own DAP that has its own functionality that did not exist until you deployed that, uh, that program. So this was really, really powerful. It enabled you know, just so many people to get into this space, including myself. And now we have all these other blockchain networks that are smart contract networks, either copying what Ethereum did or they're thinking of new ways of doing that, right? We have all these other L1s, execution environments, et cetera. So the general idea was this. It decoupled innovation and trust. You could have the innovation being built by an individual person really quickly, really easily, a lot of experimentation happening, and you didn't have to build all this other infrastructure from scratch. You're just taking all that existing infrastructure and you're innovating quickly. It's, you know, it just kind of was a game changer in terms of how quickly people could build. What we have realized though is that if we want to build for the masses, if we want to actually have true adoption around the world, and we tried to compare these types of systems with what we use today in the Web2 space, we are orders of magnitude away in terms of true scalability. At AWS, one of the most used products was called DynamoDB. And DynamoDB still is widely used today. It's powering a lot of different uh, applications that people use today, like the Amazon.com website. And on Prime Day, uh, DynamoDB was handling over 100 or around 100 million operations per second for people uh, using Amazon. 100 million operations per second is a lot more than anything that we've seen and are able to, to handle in the, in the Web3 space today. Even the most even the best blockchains, quote unquote best, that are claiming, let's say they do 10,000 K TPS or 10 K TPS, whatever, um, those blockchains are, as of today, for the most part, we're getting now to where we have more of these rollups and stuff, but um, most of these networks are monolithic and they're shared networks between everyone using that, that blockchain. So this App, this Amazon application, 100 million operations per second, that's their own database that they own. But with Solana, for example, or with Ethereum, we have thousands of apps and all of the thousands of users using all of those apps, all sharing this compute environment that is not scalable. So we are like a couple of orders of magnitude away from that type of scale. So I think what we've realized at this point is that we need to scale in two ways. We need horizontal scalability and we need vertical, vertical scalability. Vertical scalability in the blockchain world is basically faster, cheaper, and more performant execution environments. And the horizontal scalability is taking these 
faster execution environments and letting people deploy them as application-specific blockchains or rollups. And then in the future, we hope to have interoperability between all of these different networks. So then people can maybe start by building their blockchain app on a shared uh, network. They uh, have this community and this distribution built into that network maybe, that community. And then once they get users, they might decide to go and build their own rollup or their own app chain. So in 2020 and 2019, Ethereum realized this and kind of switched to this rollup centric roadmap. Um, Celestia came around, introduced and, uh, this idea of data availability. Um, we're now seeing the modular blockchain thesis kind of play out in practice. And there's tons of stuff happening in this world today. The interesting challenge, though, that we now have is that there is a lot of other infrastructure that is needed to facilitate these rollups. We need new and different types of oracles. Um, we're now seeing people take the very high, highly intensive compute and turn those into these individual coprocessor networks that are another decoupling of a uh, piece of the infrastructure, kind of how data availability layers were decoupled. We're now seeing these coprocessors also being decoupled. Uh, we're seeing the need for different types of sequencer networks. We're seeing a lot of more specialized networks that need to exist, but they don't really exist yet. So people are building tons and tons of new networks and they're all starting from the same starting point. They're building these networks from scratch, or at least they were in the past. And the idea of modularity is just decoupling um, the whole decentralized stack. And Nick talked about that a moment, a moment ago. So where we are now, or where, where we are in this presentation is um, we have the decoupling of these networks but all of this underlying infrastructure is not inheriting that same economic security of Ethereum, so people are building all of these L1s or these new uh, proof-of-stake networks for the most part from scratch. And what they need to do to do that is they need to somehow secure and validate that new network. This requires a lot of work. You not only need to build the software and make it work, you also need to bootstrap your validator and your stakers and all the people that participate in that portion of the network you often will be launching a new token. And for people to kind of find out about and acquire that new token, it's not easy. And the people that are doing that are actually exiting some other opportunity that they're participating in with that uh, money or with that stake. They might be staking on Ethereum or they might just have money in their bank account. And you want to convince them to sell that and buy your token and then participate in your network. And what this ends up looking like in early stage networks is very, very expensive security. So you have to kind of ha make up for that opportunity cost that they're losing by staking somewhere else or having their money tied up in real estate or whatever to exit that opportunity and, and now enter in your, into your network. So most networks are paying a lot for security, especially up, uh, in the early days. So the question is this, what if developers could access Ethereum's validators without making this, them stop also validating Ethereum? And that's what AVSs are offering, and AVSs are kind of the, the means to the end of Eigenlayer. AVSs are uh, short for actively validated services, and they're really any decentralized infrastructure or any infrastructure that needs to have some type of verification that would in the past have been built by bootstrapping an entire network from scratch. So if we look at the most common uh, pattern for most L1 networks or oracles or any type of network that you would kind of put in that category, it looks kind of like this. You might have uh, your, uh, and I put Ethereum here, but it really could be any type of L1 or L2 network. Um, and then you have the applications that are talking to that network. And then you have these other interoperability protocols like oracles and such that are completely separate. The idea with Eigenlayer is that you would be able to take all of the security that exists from Ethereum, use that to secure these new services, and the people that are running these services are able to opt in to that security for a lot less cost and a lot less work. So the end like, stack of what it would look like in the Eigenlayer network or in the Eigenlayer ecosystem or the Eigenlayer world, Eigenlayer contracts are kind of sitting in the middle you have the app developers that are building applications on top of these AVSs, which are essentially networks. The networks are integrated with the operators. The stakers are staking their, uh, are restaking, I guess you could say, to these operators. 
and the operators and the AVS developers are kind of coming together in this three-sided marketplace. There's also this idea of dual staking. So one of the interesting things that people wonder, it's like, why do I even need a token if, if, I, if, if this exists? Well, it's actually been very, very compelling to a lot of people that have been building, building in this space, the type of interest that they've seen from investors because to most of the people that kind of understand how this actually plays out is that their token actually has, uh, or their system has a lot better tokenomics, I guess you could say. Because they're, because they're issuing less to all these different validators and operators, they can still ultimately offer the people validating the network to either use their token or Ethereum um, restaking. And then they can issue rewards in any fashion that they'd like as well. So if they, are, if they do have their own token, they can also issue rewards back to the people running these uh, systems in their own token. And this is just a, a, a diagram of the dual staking model that exists within the protocol that you can look at from the Eigenlayer docs. So another TLDR about ABS is it's basically an app using Ethereum Trust outside of the EVM. I really like that, that example. So what are some categories of what can be built? Well, a lot of this stuff doesn't fit into any category, to be quite honest. But this is an, uh, essentially a categorization that we've put together that seems to work pretty good. You could almost consider everything on this um, top layer, or every category could fit into the roll-up services category. But within those categories, we have other categories. So we have these roll-up services that are specifically for, for what you would think of as the core pieces of a, of a roll-up infrastructure, like sequencers and bridges. Uh, and then you have the data availability layer, which is EigenDA, which was the first ABS. And then we have these other categories, like coprocessors, different forms of cryptography, proofs, and other. Other is uh, we have decentralized storage, decentralized databases. Um, we have a lot of people doing AI stuff. So let's take a look at some of the examples that exist today. The first one that I mentioned, data availability, EigenDA, very high throughput, very low cost. And one of the things that a lot of people uh, that are opting to use EigenDA like is this idea of reserved bandwidth. So you can kind of say, um, regardless of how crazy the network gets, how much uh, spikes in usage that everyone else has, I don't want it to affect my uh, network. So I can say, I need this much bandwidth, and no matter what happens with everything else, I still get that. And you kind of get away from some of the craziness that we've seen with the blob storage uh, uh, issues and things like that. Um, some other examples, though, that are beyond uh, DA. This is a really cool team that's building in this space. And they are not only using EigenDA, but they're actually building AVSs as well, and they all kind of integrate together. Uh, I wrote a blog post about what I think, why I think this is interesting. Versatis has this laser framework, which, I'm sorry, this laser uh, roll-up, which is a network that allows you to write your smart contracts in JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, and a lot of other languages that most people understand. Uh, the reason I think this is interesting is that we've seen kind of a plateau in terms of the number of blockchain developers over the last five years. Yes, it's gone up a tiny bit, but if we kind of compare that to the traditional like Web2 world of software developers that is more of like a line up, that we haven't seen nearly as much growth there. The first time we have actually opened up the world of blockchain development uh, you know, at scale, I think, to these developers has been with Farcaster Frames and also maybe with Lens Protocol's uh, uh, GraphQL API where developers didn't know to have, need to know any blockchain stuff. They could just tap into these existing APIs. And Farcaster literally blew up over the course of that week with not only new uh, developers, but new users that became interested because it was like this organic spike in, in growth and interest. And that was all due to the fact that people could then come in and write programs easily with JavaScript. So I think we need to lower the barrier to entry, get more people involved in the space. This is one uh, focus that could make that happen. They're also building out other services as well. You could almost think of this as like a cloud version, I mean, I'm sorry, a decentralized version of um, Vercel. So you have functions, compute, data storage, databases, and stuff like that. 
Uh, another new category that seems to be doing really well is coprocessors. Lagrange is a great example of that. They are a ZK coprocessor. I even have a little snippet of what their API might look like. So you can offload computationally expensive tasks off-chain, and you can also do off-chain computation similar to what an Oracle might uh, provide today. People are building databases and data stores. So we have seen people building things like IPF pinning, IPFS pinning services or uh, Rweave-like protocols. And then we have OpenDB who are building this SQLized, uh, this verified SQL database on top of uh, Eigenlayer. They already have three products within OpenDB that they're working towards. One is an archival like node type of thing for EigenDA. They also have uh, this product that's going to be almost like a vector DB. And then they have the traditional SQL API. So you can build AI uh, applications using vector database. You can use SQL for like 99% of everything. <laughs> and then uh, the archival node. Um, there's alt layer, which combine rollups as a service with ABSs. So they allow you to not only build and deploy your own rollup stack using OP, um, you can pick your you know, OP, Arbitrum, ZK Sync, but you can also choose your data availability layer. So they support EigenDA, but they also support Celestia and, and, and others, I believe. Um, but what's interesting is that they also have these vertically integrated ABSs that you can deploy along with your rollup. So you can then also have, and they call these restaked rollups. So you can also have your own, um, your own decentralized sequencer network and other pieces of the, of the stack that you completely own as an ABS. And then you can have restaking that's built into that as well, which has really been compelling to a lot of teams. Um, a lot of different rollups as a service are supporting EigenDA as well as different ABS pieces of the stack like Caldera, Conduit, and Gelato. There are new execution environments that are being built that will start off by uh, le leveraging EigenDA. So Mega ETH is one of these. They are rebuilding everything from scratch. They have the parallel execution, but they're also rebuilding other parts of the EVM as well. And it's meant to be bytecode not only bytecode compatible, but bytecode equivalent. And they are a really, really great team. I would almost compare them to something like a, a Ethereum Align Monad, uh, aiming for 10K TPS with very low transaction costs. If you want to look and learn about more ABSs, we have uh, eigenlayer.xyz slash ecosystem. So you can look at rollups, you can look at ABSs. Uh, we went to mainnet two, like last week, and we're going to be announcing a lot more ABSs uh, over the next few weeks and months. So I'll end this with a quote from Tarun that he put on Farcaster right when I joined. <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool because it was exciting <laughs> the way that he framed this. He said, I've been going to a few college hackathons recently. It is clear that no one has caught technical students' attention quite much as Eigenlayer and Sriram. I haven't seen as many crazy but impassionate ideas for infra since DeFi summer. So that's it. Um, if you want to learn more, come talk to me, and I'd be happy to chat. I'll be here today and tomorrow. So thank you. Oh, yeah. I'd be happy to take some questions. Yeah, we're sure. waiting on the next speaker a few minutes. Does anyone have any questions for Nader? I just wanted to go ahead and open it up just in case anyone has questions. You can just raise your hand. If not, you can catch. Oh, here we go. We got two already. Uh, yeah, could you please elaborate more on your collaboration with Espresso and maybe explain if, uh, uh, because in my understanding, Espresso had their own basically blockchain and they still use uh, Eigenlayer to increase their security. <coughs> and can other blockchains, uh, maybe layer ones, also use Eigenlayer to? Uh, reuse security of Ethereum to enhance their security? What are your thoughts about that? I think I understood the question at first about, was it about Espresso decentralized yeah. sequencers? Okay, and then, oh, thank you. That's now facing my ear. Um, anyway, no, that's good, it's good, it's fine. I, I was just, anyway. Um, so I, I didn't catch the second part of your question. Do you mind repeating it? Uh, yeah. Uh, can other blockchains also uh, reuse security of Ethereum, like uh, other layer ones, uh, use Eigenlayer to enhance their security? Exactly. Yeah, Eigenlayer? that's a great question. So first of all, I don't know enough about how Espresso functions under the hood. There was a really good, if you, uh, if you want to learn more about 
not only like the eigenlayer ecosystem, but also um, a lot of other things happening within the modular quote unquote space. There's a new, uh, it's kind of, a sort of kind of new podcast YouTube channel called The Roll Up. They've been posting videos like every two days and they did a really great one with Espresso. So that would probably be where I would go to learn more about Espresso. But in terms of other networks using uh, AVSs, yes. So Near Protocol is, is actually building an AVS that um, integrates with their protocol. Um, it, it doesn't matter really what you build. It's really kind of hard to, to theoretically like understand the main difference between where we were before versus where we are now with how this all, all this stuff works because you literally have no dependency on Ethereum at all in the application of the protocol itself. It's just a mechanism for securing that as how it's integrated with Ethereum, but beyond that, you can build anything. So we have people building with like Move uh, VM. We have people building in uh, completely different ecosystems like Near. And yes, you uh, you do not have any coupling of, of Ethereum at all. So. Yeah. Oh. Hey there, Farhan from Maple. Uh, really loving what you guys do. I think. This is like very Ethereum aligned and cool. Um, and my question is more around the economic modeling of things. So if I understand correctly, the incentive to restake is you'll get extra yield. And operators opt into different AVS services because they'll generate extra yield through using these AVS services. So what are you seeing in terms of like the economics of like some of the new AVS services that are common like Eigen DA might make sense if you know tokens or when token, but what about like an Oracle, for example? Like how would they generate enough to ins have a token to then incentivize via their AVS these operators to actually justify running the Oracle through the AVS system through Eigen yep. versus like just chain link using that directly, for example. So curious if you have some thoughts on that. Totally. That's a good question. I think, I think the main difference is more like, OK, if I'm building a, a DAP and Chainlink supports my use case, then I probably just will use Chainlink. I think the people building oracles right now are building more specialized like use cases. For example, if you want to easily have an oracle that supports your brand new rollup, I don't think Chainlink plays well with that. They, you know, they're very hard to have support to the best of my understanding, and they're expensive even for them to support some of the new networks. So some of these other networks are actually, you know, more. Um, just gritty and trying to get business and they're giving support. So like, you, you probably wouldn't, um, I would say, choose between building your own uh, Oracle or using Chainlink. You would instead use Chainlink or use maybe one of these other Oracles that was happened to be built on Eigenlayer. Uh, how was that security going to be paid? Well, I mean, just like Chainlink's model, they launched a token um, and the token has some type of utility maybe. Um, that's really up to the AVS team to figure that out. but. Um, in the terms of the stakers themselves, like you can choose which operators that you want to stake to, and you can kind of understand your risk to uh, tolerance based on how many things they're securing. So me, I might just say, oh, I want to go stake with this uh, operator who's servicing 100 different AVSs, and I'm going to get 101 rewards because I'm yielding from 100 AVSs and Ethereum, which also kind of possibly puts me at a, lot, a higher risk tolerance because I'm now uh, at the, like, uh, you know, if anything happens with any of these 100 ABSs, then I kind of have some type of, um, you know, slashing that could happen in the future. But you might instead say, okay, I trust EigenDA or I trust this other two or three and I'm going to stake with an operator that only supports a handful of uh, different ABSs and I'm still yielding like from five or six different protocols, but I have less risk. So that's the way I look at it. All right, any last questions? All right, super excited about Eigenlayer. Thank you so much, Nader. Thank you.